Ladies and gentlemen, the Newton Nomadic Theater presents Story Slam. So, I'm 11 or 12 years old, and I'm sitting in my parents' den on Gordon Road in Wabin, and I'm watching the TV. And my sister's off doing her homework. My brother, I don't know where he is. My parents aren't, aren't there. I don't know what's, where they are. But um, I'm watching and I'm mesmerized by the snow coming down uh, on, on the TV screen. And as I c continue to watch, I realize that it's actually not snow. It's actually the fallout from a nuclear war or a depiction of a nuclear war between the United States and the Soviet Union. This was, as m some of you might remember, an ABC miniseries called The Day After. Well, it scared me, and uh, it, it made a huge impression. So fast forward then to high school, and I was taking chemistry, and chemistry did not work for me. It just, for some reason, I couldn't get it. And so back then, I think you were able to petition, and I petitioned to substitute Russian for chemistry, and they, they said, okay. So I was there I was, taking Russian instead of chemistry, and I was like, I'm still going to graduate. They said, yep, no problem. And, um, you know, I, I had these visions of grandeur of possibly bringing together the Soviet Union and the people of the Soviet Union and, and of America and helping everybody understand that we, we all don't want to kill each other. And so that was why I took the Russian language. I went on to college and got a degree in Soviet East European studies. So I continued with this passion for Russian. And um, I graduate, and as Jerry said, I was, I was really a lost soul. I mean, I didn't know what to do with a degree in Soviet East European studies. Um, so at the time, I applied to law school, I applied to business school, I applied to international relations schools. I was kind of lost. And at the end, I just said, you know what? I'm not going to do any of these schools. I have a choice in front of me. And one was I could either move home and live with my parents for a while to figure things out, or I could take some money that I had earned as an ice cream man in Newton the previous summer and go on a trip, a 30-day tour, to Leningrad. Living with my parents, while it seemed really appealing, was not going to work. So I went to Leningrad, but prior to going, I said to myself, wouldn't it be cool if I could actually get a job there and stay? And so I, I networked with my parents' friends, and I was able to set up one interview in Moscow. So I get to Leningrad, and, and for those who have traveled, those first couple weeks when you're there, it's just amazing, the new culture, the people, the food. And for me, speaking the Russian language, or trying to, was just a terrific experience. Two weeks in, I said to the tour guide, I'm just going to go to Moscow for a couple nights, I hope you don't mind, and I have an interview. And he looked at me, and I don't know if he was KGB or what, and he said, we just can't let you go anywhere. We have to be looking out for you. And he said, and he knew, he, he, could re, he realized that there was no way he was, he was stopping me. So he said, look, go to Moscow. I have some friends there. You can stay with them and make sure that you're checking in with them. So I take that overnight train from Leningrad to Moscow, and I get to Moscow. And this is in August of 1991. And um, I drop my stuff off at the apartment, and I go to this interview. And I'm nervous about the interview because I don't know if I'm going to have to be speaking in Russian or English or what. But this big man comes out, he's got rosy cheeks, and he's, uh, his hair is, he's losing his hair, and he starts speaking English with a thick Boston accent, just like my dad's. And I'm like, oh, this is going to work great. So this was a, a guy from South Boston, actually, and he just wanted to talk to an American. So we got along very well. And um, during the interview, the way it was set up was um, I was sitting here, there was a, a desk here, and he was sitting right there, and there was a huge window behind him. And right outside the window was Leninsky Prospect, which is a huge thoroughfare going in and out of the center of Moscow. And there's traffic going left and right and just so much traffic that it was hard not to notice. And then all of a sudden, as we're talking and he's interviewing me, like a spigot, there's no traffic anymore. And I look and I'm like, what is going on? He can't see it. And then from the distance, I see these greenish vehicles coming slowly towards us. And as they get right in front of the building, I notice these are tanks. These are militia. These are um, all types of military vehicles with young men, 18, 19, 20, all with their guns. And I say to the interviewer, is this normal? He jumps to my side of the desk and says, absolutely not. I don't know what's going on here, but the interview's over. And I, th I think back and I say, you know, this could be, you know, I learned in, in college that maybe because Gorbachev was reformer and because he was underfunding the military, could it be the coup? Could it be a coup? 
I didn't know. So the interviewer says to me, you go to the apartment and call me later. And I said, absolutely. And as I was saying that, I knew I was lying. So I go downstairs, I get a taxi. I do go to the apartment, but I go there to get my camera. And I tell the taxi driver, take me right to the center of Moscow. And he thinks I'm crazy, which I would have questioned at the time as well. I get down there, and it's just mayhem. And you, know, you see people all over the place with um, huddling together, uh, those that are pro-communist, typically those were the older people, those that were younger, that were really looking for reform and really liked that this was a, a um, that, want, that didn't want the, the coup to, to succeed. And you, I was, as I was walking around, you'd see more tanks in the streets. There was a bus that was blocking a whole caravan of militia and tanks right from, uh, from blocking them from getting to the Kremlin. At one point, I did get caught up and I was stuck behind a tank that was right in front of me and, and a lot of different people, protesters all behind me. I couldn't really move anywhere. But I used to be a gymnast and uh, I was a gymnast in high school and the one thing I did notice was right in front of me in the tank were these rungs on the tank. And so I looked around, I knew I had my camera and I climbed up onto the top of the tank. Now I get up there and I'm, I'm shooting pictures furiously because as I get up there I notice I'm the only civilian on top of a tank. What I'm looking at at this point are three rows of tanks, militia all over the place, cleaning their guns, going into the hatches, and one of them sees me. And as he sees me, he's pointing at me. And then I hear from the side some Russians screaming. I don't know what that's all about. But I look at them and I notice they're screaming at me. And then I notice here and, and the, the soldier's actually running towards me. Um, and I noticed that also all of the other militia are actually going into their tanks. So I'm a little nervous at this point. Then suddenly, the, uh, the tank I'm on jolts and all the tanks start moving a little bit. Um, and the, the, the exhaust comes up and I'm wheezing from the ex exhaust. I get down on four knees and I'm like, I gotta get out of here. So I jump down, take another shot while I'm between the tanks and in, in between the exhaust. And then I crawl through people's legs and get onto some grass where my heart is beating out of my chest. Um, but this was the beginning of my three-year journey and um, where everything from the militia to, and, and the KGB to the mafia um, was all part of the experience and the whole experience was really a long way from home. Thank you.